फोर थ्री टू वन गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन वी वेलकम यू ऑल टू ऑर्थो टीवी ऑनलाइन इन एसोसिएशन विद दीज पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट क्लिनिक्स दिस इज एन एक्सटेंशन ऑफ दी प्रोग्राम विच वॉज कंडक्टेड इन आयोकॉन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन इन गोवा एंड इट वॉज वेरी पॉपुलर एंड देर वॉज अ हाई डिमांड दैट दीज क्लिनिक्स शुड ऑल्सो बी एक्सटेंडेड टू ऑल ओवर इंडिया वेर पीपल वर नॉट एबल टू अटेंड इट सो डॉक्टर हर्षद आर्गेकर एंड डॉक्टर तुषार अगरवाल वर द कन्वीनर्स ऑफ दिस प्रोग्राम अग्रीड टू डू दीज क्लिनिक्स ऑनलाइन and with this i hand over to dr rashid agre argekar to introduce today's program and take it ahead so good evening everybody uh, today is the first in a series of post graduate uh, online teaching programs uh, which we are planning uh, to hold all throughout this month of january february and march maybe extending it on to april and may till the exams uh, are conducted so the aim and objective of our post graduate teaching program is to focus only on questions or uh, or uh, cases which come in your uh, ms or dnb exams and we are focusing on short cases this is where the make and break of your uh, exam happens and a uh, lot of people lot of students make stupid and silly mistakes and uh, which otherwise they would if they were trained well or they knew how to answer they would not Uh, hesitate so lack of confidence because they haven't heard the questions properly and uh, they don't know how to approach a case they don't know how to approach a diagnosis so our aim in this series is just to make you prepared for the exam it is not going to teach you basics individual tests maybe we can elaborate on certain tests but that is not the aim to teach you the test we assume you know something about how to examine a patient we know we assume that you know something about how to go about taking a proper history what we are going to plan on is to teach you what not to miss and how to how to check certain findings correctly and how do you differentiate uh, in a differential diagnosis and come to a conclusion as to what is the correct uh, pathology on that patient so in this regard i i have a esteemed faculty today we have dr rajiv maharjan who is from nepal he is a professor uh, in a medical college in nepal and dr tushar agarwal again a senior uh, orthopedic surgeon and my colleague professor at mgm plus having his own practice at kandivli then dr taral nagra who is a well known very renowned uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon uh, reputed all over india perhaps uh, in many countries in the world he will be telling us something about uh pediatric elbow injuries and finally uh, i am going to take a talk on uh, elbow uh, related to non union of the lateral condyle so today we are doing the first session this is the first uh, session of this pg teaching program and i have chosen to start with the elbow and this is part 1 of the elbow there will be another part 2 and a part 3 we will be trying to cover uh, all uh, short cases which come in the elbow if this session is uh, working out well and everybody is happy with it then we can go on to other joints and finish uh, each and every joint as it happens so i would also expect some feedback from the delegates because that is important if this series has to continue we have to receive adequate viewerships and also get proper feedback so that if necessary we can change something add something or modify our talk so as to suit you the best again let me reiterate that this is just for people who are going for the exam this is not basic teaching this is a little advanced where we polish you so as to attend uh, and successfully clear the exam so that you don't make blunders there and basic things are taken care of so uh, let me start off immediately calling upon dr rajiv maharjan professor from nepal and uh, he was there in ioa con it took an excellent talk on examination of the elbow So, Dr. Rajiv Marjan, over to you. Okay, Alam. Would am I audible, sir? Yes, yeah, you are. Am I audible? So, yes, is yes. my slide visible? Is my slide visible now? Yes. Okay, a warm good evening to all from Nepal. I am Dr. Rajiv Marjan, working as an adjunct professor of orthopedics in the BP Kerala Institute of Health Sciences. 
I would like to thank Tushar sir, Arshad sir, and all the IOA Ortho TV team, especially Neeraj Bijlani sir and Ashok Shyam sir for providing this platform to enrich the PG education in our PG education. So my first talk, the, today's first talk is on examination of elbow. So no thing to disclose, no country interest. Uh, as a student, you must have some uh, prerequisite. You must be, have a cooperation, consent, and confidence during examination, be ready with your skin markers, paints, and all the measuring tips. The far and foremost thing is uh, the exposure. You should expose We have to expose the both, both the sides, and if possible, uh, the options. I think with uh, Dr. Marjan, uh, we having some connective issues, uh, connectivity issue, Dr. Marjan. What you can do is stop your video, just run your audio and your uh, slide share. So then uh, there will be a uh, bandwidth available for you. And uh, please go back one more slide so that you can start uh, from your slide, from the previous slide. Yes, that's right. Start from here. We still can't hear you. Dr. Rajiv, are you muted? He is unmuted, but his audio is not coming. No, no, am I? No, I'm not muted. Am I? Now we can hear you. Hello. Am I audible now, sir? Yeah. Uh, first yeah, thing yeah. is, the patient must be cooperative. You must take consent from the patient, and you must be confident enough while doing examination. And you should be ready with your skin markers, pens, pencils, measuring tapes, etc. Now, regarding exposure, uh, you must expose properly from neck or solar region to the mid fingertip, of course, both the sides in identical position. Now, for if you see in this figure, you first thing you must discuss is the attitude. It is the position of the joint and the limb per se. You see, it may be embarrassed. I think Dr. Rajiv, there is a problem as far as your audio is concerned. It is uh, not coming across clearly at all. Dr. Rajiv, can we uh, have you in an area where your connectivity is better? So you can connect your uh, mobile hotspot with your laptop temporarily so that your internet will not be having any issues. <laughs> yeah, so Dr. Rajiv, suggestion to you is to use your mobile phone as a hotspot and connect your laptop to it so that you get better bandwidth. And uh, till you sort out your problem, can we just go ahead uh, and let Dr. Tushar present his case? Dr. Tushar? 
Yeah, yeah, I'm there. You want me to start? Yeah, I think so because uh, Rajiv will just sort his problems out. In the meanwhile, let's go ahead and let's not keep the people waiting for that. Tushar is going to talk about uh, malunited supraconduyla resulting in cubitus virus deformity. So is this seen, right? Everything is seen. It's good. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, guys, good evening. Thanks for joining in. Uh, as Arshad said, we had a great time doing the Goa workshop. So, we thought, why not take it as an extension and do it through the year for our students. So, uh, I'll be talking on Cubitus virus. It's probably a 100% chance that every second one of you as PG students going to get this case in the exam. Uh, so, there is no way you can goof up in this case. Uh, because examiners will not be tolerating it at all. And uh, not a single wrong answer will be sort of acceptable, right? Uh, the other lecture which I had taken was on cerebral palsy. So the bandwidth for examiners to really accept it is much higher. Now, uh, the other name for this cubitus virus, uh, as you will all be familiar, is gunstock. Okay. And uh, its uh, main reason is that you are not going to be calling it a cubitus virus till you have full extension. Till you have full extension and supination, you can actually call it a gunstock deformity. So this one particular point you should remember. It is cubitus virus only when you have full extension and you have full supination. Till that time, you call it a gunstock deformity. Also, most of us seem to think that all the cubitus virus that we see is due to a sort of a neglected or an untreated type 3 supracondylar fracture. However, most of us are not familiar with the fact that there is a type 1B supracondylar fracture, which is an actually an impacted medially or a commutated medially kind of a supracondylar fracture and a rotationally unstable type 2 fracture. This is um, more in the type 2B type of supracondylar fracture where the anterior humeral line passes in the front of the capitulum and you do a close reduction and then from a stable it becomes an unstable injury and you are not actually fixing it with wires so it can go into virus and it can also happen when you are treating the supracondylar type 3 but somehow your eyes don't perceive that you have sort of stabilized it in rotation and believe me it can happen to any one of us you know people who treat a lot of supracondylars also once in a while can land up with this situation so the, uh, pro the professor previous to me, Dr. Rajiv, his lecture will take this in great detail. However, these images um, should come into your mind the moment you have a pediatric elbow case. How is the patient going to be standing? How are you going to be standing? Where, by which hand are you going to examine the right elbow? How are you going to palpate for the con uh, epicondylar points? So these are the kind of images which should stand. So from the front, from the back, Okay, with as maximum possible extension in mid flexion, in full flexion, how are you going to see the three point bony relationship? If the examiner asks you to demonstrate, okay, there is hyperextension, then demonstrate the hyperextension. You are saying there's 30 degrees of hyperextension. So, how are you going to say? So, this is the way you are going to demonstrate the hyperextension of the elbow. If you are going to say that there is a flexion block, so you have to demonstrate. So you see that the left elbow has lesser flexion as compared to the right elbow. So you're going to be using a flat board or a table on which you're going to rest the arm and then ask the patient to bend the elbow. Very obviously, this is the way you're going to be seeing the pronation and supination. So in this particular patient, the pronation is restricted on the left side. These are to demonstrate the external rotation and internal rotation. So in supracondylar, you may be able to demonstrate that the external rotation is somewhat restricted and the internal rotation is somewhat exaggerated. This is a famous test called Yamamoto test. At least for all the exam going students, it's very important. So the one on the left has a higher level of internal rotation. So that is positive Yamamoto test for the left side. Now, what is not a supracondylar? So any patient who has, uh, uh, you know, a flexion deformity, he may have restricted flexion, but if, like on the left side here. So if you have flexion deformity, 
then it is definitely not a supracondyle. And the X-rays will immediately tell you that it is not a supracondyle. So with that previous X-ray, what I was trying to image, what I was trying to tell you is, you should have a very clear image. A cubitus virus case is going to be one with full extension and full supination. If you don't have full extension and full supination, don't call it cubitus virus. It may be an apparent virus and it will not be due to a malunited supracondyle. So you are not going to sort of blurt the diagnosis that it is cubitus virus due to a malunited supracondylar fracture. Okay. Now, how do you measure the carrying angle? So there are a couple of points here. So you go from the anterior axillary fold to the lateral margin of the deltoid bulge and you take the midpoint of that point A. Interepicondylar midpoint is point B and interstyloid midpoint is point C. So from A to B and B to C, the angle you are going to be measuring. So you need to practice this again and again with your friends, colleagues. You are going to be practicing this again and again. Unless you practice it, you get it verified. It's never going to happen spontaneously. Okay. Now, this is how you are going to be demonstrating the three-point bony relationship with both hands on the iliac crest. So there is equal flexion of both the elbows. And then preferably, if you can buy and keep a vernier caliper, then you can actually demonstrate the three-point bony relationship using a vernier caliper. Now, when it comes to three-point bony correlationship, there are some interesting observations. So number of orthopedic surgeons were asked that what do they think, whether these th the three-point bony relation triangle, what is it? Is it an equilateral triangle, an isosceles triangle, or a scalene triangle? And there was a complete dispute. They were divided in, in between, and most of the people thought it was an equilateral triangle. The rest thought it was an isosceles triangle. And it's not surprising as most of the textbook variations also that we know, including Gray's anatomy, is also telling us that it was an isosceles triangle. The only book which actually tells us the truth is our DAS, the clinical examination book DAS, which tells us that actually it is a scalene triangle. So if some of your examiner asks you, okay, do you know whether this is an isosceles scalene or equilateral? You must say that, yes, sir, we have been given to, we have been given to understand that it is a scalene triangle. For all patients of elbow injury, you will want them to do these three tests the rock, paper, and scissors. So this is going to tell you the three nerve involvement. So if you can make a fist, median nerve not involved. If you can do this spread, the radial nerve is not involved. And if you can make the scissors, the ulnar nerve is not involved. Now, the other important question which is asked always is the Bowman's angle. And why is it confusing? Because from the time we have been reading, like I cleared the MS ortho in 97. So the Campbell, which we were reading, itself had the third image of this Bowman's angle. So sometimes you are measuring the Bowman's angle, which is between the long axis and this oblique line. Sometimes you are measuring this as the Bowman's angle and sometimes it's all confusing. So you have to clearly understand that there is one longitudinal axis of the humerus and there is one axis along the capitular line. That's it. And this is the angle, which is the Bowman's angle. Okay. And what you need to know is, that a five degrees Bowman's angle shift amounts to a two degrees carrying angle shift. And a normal Bowman angle range is 64 to 81, average is 72. So you have to memorize these figures. A five degrees Bowman angle shift gives you two degrees of carrying angle shift. And the Bowman's angle range is 64 to 81, average being 72. So you have the long axis of the humerus, you have a perpendicular to it, and you have the Fischel line, right? And now you want to drop this line and you want to just take this particular angle as your Bowman's angle. Just remember that one thing. So this is an illustrative case of cubitus virus. Okay. What's happening here is that you can see that there is virus here. This is the way I corrected, fixator assisted. Okay. And the virus is restored to valgus. So you will find that there are numerous ways of handling. Now, some key questions we will immediately take. And the most important is, doctor, do you really want to advise correction to this patient? And if you say yes, why are you saying yes? So you are going to say that the principal problems are cosmetic and not just cosmetic. The patient is going to get posterolateral instability, can get pain, 
can get tardy ulnar nerve palsy can have increase incidence of lateral condylar fractures and in the long run can have change in the elbow joint some people do mention that surgeons sports player are actually at an advantage with a malunited supracondylar and cubitus varus but that's not what we are here as orthopedic surgeons for because that's unpredictable right so we are going to correct cubitus varus and for these reasons and how will you correct so you have you have to do with a osteotomy the preferred one is a lateral closing wedge osteotomy there are numerous other osteotomies which are described gradually you expand your knowledge and learn about the other osteotomies definitely you should know a little bit about each so medial opening wedge osteotomy will be better in cosmesis Fr modified french osteotomy you must know the lateral oblique equal limb osteotomy step cut osteotomies all these three osteotomies are actually created in order to do massive correction without the exaggerated medial the exaggerated bump on the lateral side you want to translate the distal fragment medially so when you do these advanced osteotomies you are able to translate the distal fragment medially and you are able to get larger corrections with a lesser bony cut and get a better outcome so this is what you have to remember that if i am going to do an alternative osteotomy i am doing it so that my bony bony wedge that i remove is less sir also i'll translate the distal fragment medially easily and automatically and the unsightly lateral bony bump will not be there there are lot of people who are now using the dome osteotomy and for dis for discussion purposes you can mention distraction osteogenesis but a very elizaro enthusiast examiner may like to hear it so the next question the examiner will ask is doctor do you think this uh, case can be completed without complication see the most likely i will not have complications but they are described they are described up to 12% 14% complications are described there can be nerve palsies but they are transient i can under correct or over correct or i can lose my correction if my fixation is not correct i can get post operative infection especially if there is low grade infection if i cause that pin track infection is a definite problem and like i mentioned the lateral prominence should always be tackled especially when you have a large quantum of correction and fixation tools are k wires threaded pins screws screws wires external fixator and small plates in the older kits now this is also a very notable question doctor are you going to only correct the varus or are you going to do the sagittal plane correction or are you going to do internal rotation correction so my take is from this article is that you may not want to correct all three planes because then your correction can become suboptimal the patient has come to us for varus so your principal concentration should only be on varus correction however if your patient is more than 10 years and if you have a significant sagittal plane restriction flexion restriction then you will also attempt to do the anterior wedge resection so that you can get a a good amount of flexion at the end of the surgery so for your exam you are going to say sir ideally if the patient is less than 10 i'll focus on the varus correction if the patient is more than 10 and if there is significant block of flexion i will correct biplanar correction if possible and if the skill set is there i will attempt all three plane correction but not at the expense of varus correction this is an article written by sandeep patwardhan ashok sham i personally feel for all pg students it has answer to every question on this case if you read this particular article before you go for the exam you will do well so get this article for yourself it's a open source article it's available so in short you can't goof up on this case read up as much as you can be prepared you know with each and every form of osteotomy the examiner can really start going at depth if you are doing well at the elementary level at clinical examination this is one case where the examiner may not hesitate to ask you more question on bowman's angle more question on osteotomies so try to know as neatly and correctly as possible on all the osteotomies okay when to correct how to correct how much to correct how to counsel the patients all these answers to all these questions you should know and try to get as long films as possible to plan your correction uh with that i end my talk uh thank you tushar
Thank you, Dushar. Uh, very to the point and uh, absolutely what is required. Uh, do delegates have any questions? What we'll do is now we'll have uh, Dr. Rajiv uh, to start his talk uh, again. Dr. Rajiv, can you please share your screen and then we'll try again to see if your connection is better than what it was. You have any yeah, questions? You can please put it on the chat, or you can directly ask me till uh, Dr. Rajiv is uh, getting his thing set up. Rajiv, start from a slide four. Yeah, uh, can uh, are you seeing my slides, sir? We can see your slides and we can hear you also. Okay. Let's hope it. Okay, happens. okay. Yeah, yeah, I said. Okay. So sorry for the interruption. Uh, sorry for the interruption because of this internet. So we are in this slide. I think we are in this slide. Yes, this one. Okay. So in the in this figure, if you see this, this is a long axis of the arm. And this is the long axis of the forearm. Which, so the long axis of the arm is divided inwards in comparison to the arm. So that's called a virus here. Similarly, in the next figure, there is long axis of the arm, and this is the forearm, where the long axis of the arm is divided outward, outward with respect to the arm. This is a gives valgus. So you must mention the in the attitude, the position of the joint and limb per se, and the cubitus varus, rectus, or valgus at times. Elbow may be personally flexed. There may be apparent shortening or lengthening of the arm. You should not forget to mention any deformities on the hand, especially the clawings, deformities, and wastings during exams of the elbow. Uh, while inspecting from the anterior, the most there are few things that you must not forget. In general, you mention about the scar, sinuses, all these things, and wasting the arm and forearm muscle. The other important thing you must mention is the medial lateral gut of the elbow. What I mean to say, this is the middle lateral gut of the elbow, which may be increased in case of intercondylar fractures, fracture of middle condyle, lateral condyle, and so many conditions. In the exam, um, I must foc you must focus on the inspection of the cubital fossa to see any fullness or not. There may be a loss of normal concavity of the elbow, there will be loss of elbow creases, or there may be some abnormal bone in prominences, abnormal fullnesses. You must comment on the fullness of the elbow. So this is the elbow where you may see the fullness of cubitus fossa. On inspection of middle side, of course, you mentioned about the middle supercondylar depressions. You mentioned about the, any prominence of middle epicondyles, and as well as the anterior posterior gut of the elbow and the wasting of the arm and forearm muscle here from the middle side, proximal middle forearm muscles. So this is what I mean to say the anterior and posterior gut of the elbow. Similarly, if inspection lateral side, at times, cubitus recurvatum may be present, which is obvious. If you see this, this is the long axis of the arm, and this is the long axis of the forearm, which is much going extend beyond that of the arm. You are showing there is a showing there is a cubitus recurvatum. And, uh, and the other thing is, uh, you must uh, inspect whether there is supracondylar depression on that side or not. The, the other important thing that you mustn't forget is if there are any prominent prominences on the lateral, if you call the lateral condylar area or not. It may be a one of the lateral condylar fracture which has failed to unite, or it may be a prominent radial head. If you haven't mentioned about the anterior posterior guard during the inspection from the medial, how you can mention this anterior posterior guard from the inspection during the lateral side. But the other thing is you must. Uh, See for any fullness in the Anconis triangle, which I'm going to describe shortly on the you know, success slides. And of course, you must mention about the wastings, uh, wastings if present. Uh, while inspecting from the posterior, you have to flex both the elbows to 90 degree and keep them over the head in symmetrical position. Important points you must inspect are the more far and foremost thing, triceps tenting where the tricep tendon acts, it stands out prominent as a pan 
or fibrotic band, which you will see most in cases, mostly in case of negative elbow dislocation. You must see the paraocon fullness for the presence of any myositic mass. And you must inspect three bony points for the appearances or prominences and the location and relationships. And the other important things, thing in inspection from posterior is the proximal ulna. In case of Montezia fracture, malnutrient Montezia fracture dislocation, the deformity on the proximal ulna may be obvious on inspection. Now, coming to palpation, you can palpate the biceps tendon and brachial artery as usual, but palpation of the cubital fossa is very much important from examination point of view, which gives many important clues towards printing the diagnosis. For and foremost important is for the anterior bony lase. Anterior bony lase is a sap pain which may be failed during the because of malrotation in a supercondral fracture. The bony lase is the distal fra uh, fracture fragment of the progenital fragment. Distal end of the progenital fragment because of rotation, it may feel to your finger as a hard sap is. And the other thing is myositic mass because elbow is one of the commonest sites of myositic mass among, around the elbow. It may feel as an infantile mass. It may be well-defined or ill-defined depending upon the stage of the myositic mass. The third important thing you may palpate is, at times you may palpate the distal arcuate surface of the humerus. This is especially when there is elbow is dislocated posteriorly and the distal end of arcuate surface of the humerus may be palpated anteriorly in the cubital fossa. At times you may have a fluctuation may be failed because when there is effusion is there, you may, the joint line tenderness may be, may be present on palpation on the anterior side. Now similarly in a palpation from medial side, of course, uh, you must palpate the medial superconal ridge for three things, whether it is smooth or not, whether they are tender or not, and whether they are thickened or not. Depending upon the cases, they may be smooth, non-thickened, non-tender, or maybe tender one, like that. Next is the medial epicondyle. You have to com comment whether it is more prominent or less prominent or hypoplastic like that. At times, there may be some abnormal, mobile, a bony non-tender mass may be, may be found, found when there is a case of neglected middle epicondyle fracture, like that. At times, you may have a supraconal lymph nodes may be palpable. The other important thing that you must palpate uh, from mid side is the ulnar knob. And you must comment on whether it's thickened or not, tender or not. Or at times, it may be a subluxating ulnar knob. Now, on the palpation from lateral side, Similarly, uh, you have to feel for the lateral supercondyle ridge for the smooth or not, regular or not, and tender or not. And uh, depending upon the case, it may be smooth, non thickened or non tender like that. And the lateral condyle in the traditional lateral side, uh, you may the palpate the unnoted fragment of lateral condyle, which may feel as abnormal, mobile, bony hard mass, which may be tender, may not be tender. Sometimes. You may palpate a globular bone, globular spare, globular, globular prominence, which rotates with the rotation of the forearm, prominence and suspension of the forearm. That may be a your radial head. After that, you may palpate the radio capital joint for any joint line tenderness. And of course, there is an anconist triangle formed by the head radius, lateral, lateral condyle, and the tip of the olecranon. Any fullness or pathology or effusion in the elbow joint will first obliterate the anconius triangle. Now, coming to palpation posterior, as I mentioned in that, you, we must inspect for the, any presence of triceps tenting. Now, if, if it's so, you palpate for the triceps, whether they are tenting or not, whether they are taut or not, or fibrotic or not. And other is, you must, we must palpate for the paleoregon fossa for presence of any myositic mass. Other times, if there is a, use effusion is there, we may elicit a cross fluctuation. And the other thing is uh, we must palpate the olecranon tip for swelling or bursitis, like in olecranon bursitis, it may see for, we may feel for tenderness for the factors. And of course, three plant bony relationship you must palpate. If you keep the elbow in 90 degree flex position, 
it forms an isosceles triangle as a classical shape, but nowadays the recent concept is that it forms a scalene triangle as we have just mentioned. This is the three-point bone relationship, relationships when the elbow is flexed to 90 degree, right side and left side. You must compare these all the three sides with the right side and that of left side. When extended the elbow, uh, these three, like, three points will form a straight line instead of on a triangle. Our next is movement. Movement of elbow is much important. Normal direction of flexion is from 0 to 130 degree and hyper extension is 0 to 20 degree or extension is 0 to 20 degree. The function in the motion is uh, considered as 30 to 130 degrees. And while assessing the flexion and extension of the elbow, Classically, it is to be done, it is to the arm and forearm is to be kept on a hard surface like table, it is. But if you do like that, uh, we cannot assess the recurve atom. If you keep in the, if you keep, if you keep the, if you examine the hard surface. And whenever assessing a range of motion, we must see whether it is painful or is SOD capitus. This. Now, regarding the range of motion, Regarding range of motion, if you see the first uh, this first figure, if you see that this is the long axis of the arm, and if this is the long axis of the forearm, yet it appears that there is the uh, extension is full. Now on atomic flexion, if you see this, this is the full extension is there. In the figure, if she try whenever she try to flex the elbow, this long axis of the arm, this long axis of the arm. And this is the angle of flexion. Now you see it is about 120 degrees. So the flexion is from zero to 120 degrees for this patient. Now if you see, consider on the second figure, this is the uh, arm and forearm axis. It seems elbow is completely extended. So the extension is complete. Now if you see when trying to flex, see this, this is the long axis of the arm. This is the long axis of the forearm. And this is only 70 degree only there. So the, though the extension is zero, the complete is there, but the flexion is only from zero to 70 degree. Here the flexion is lost beyond 70 degree. Now, if you consider on this, if you consider on this figure, this is the ex long axis of the arm, this is long axis of the forearm. The boy is trying to extend it completely, however, he could not. So this is about 50 degree. So this 50 degree extension is lost here. So he, the 50 degree, only the range of motion, instead of starting from zero, there is 50 degree only, beyond which he could not extend. He couldn't extend it. But however, the flexion is possible up to 140 degree. So this figure shows that there is a flexion deformity of 50 degree. But since the extension is not possible beyond 50 degree, or he cannot bring the forearm to neutral, we consider it as there is 50 degree of fixed flexion deformity with further range of motion from 15 to 140 degree. So this is uh, almost 140 degree. Now, if would, next is next range of motion is a position in supination, which is measured from the uh, neutral position, uh, mid prone position. And uh, now, usual position and supination is 0 to 90 degree for each of them. Of course, while assessing the pronation and supination, uh, the arm should be adducted and elbow should be flexed to 90 degree so as to avoid the trick movement occurring from the solar joint. And the functional lens of motion for supination and pronation is 0 to 50 degree each. Now, in this figure, if you see that this is uh, the angle of pronation, of course, we have to measure from mid prone position and move in a such a way that the palm will be facing downward, that would be the pronation. So this is the position is 90 degree. Similarly, in this figure, the supination is 90 degree here. Now, next is the rotation, the I mean internal and external rotation. Now, another important thing is that though it is an examination of elbow, we indirectly assess the rotational deformities of the elbow as an from the as an indirect evidence from the solar design. So we, we can assess the internal and the external rotation in the adductor arm as well as abducted arm. Now in this figure, if you see this, sorry. In this figure, this is the external rotation in the adducted arm. And this is 
the extension in the abit arm. However, this is the interrotation in the abdicted arm. However, in this figure, if you see, it is difficult to assess the internal, internal rotation in an abdicted arm because trunk is hindered. So it is better to show the adduction and ab, sorry, the abduct, internal rotation and external rotation of this solo join in an abducted arm. Now next is the measurement. Of course, we must measure the three-point bony relationships. It's formed by lateral condyle, olecranon, and the middle epic condyle, and compare it opposite side. However, according to recent concept, it is said that they are no more forming an isosceles triangle, rather they form an scalene triangle. Even the side on the one side and other side are different. The one side, even the arm, even the same, even the same ipsilateral side and the condyle side, if you compare two sides, the, the length may be different. Next, the linear measurement. What linear measurement? We have an apparent and true measurement. Apparent length from the C7 spine process to the real twilight. And the true length is from the angle of acromion to the real twilight. If you, if you palpate your uh, thumb along the spine of scapula laterally, laterally, at point suddenly it turns out anterior, it takes an anterior drop. The point at which your thumb takes certain anterior point, anterior tone, that is the angle of acromion. From the angle of acromion to the radial twilight is the true length of the upper limb, true length of the upper limb. You can measure the segmental length for arm and forearm separately. The length between angle of acromion uh, to lateral condyle is the arm length. However, the lateral condyle to radial twilight is the angle, uh, this is the uh, true length of the forearm. So this figure is showing the apparent length of upper limb. So this is how do you locate the angle of acromion. We mark the angle of acromion. From there to the, uh, the lateral condyle gives the true length of the arm. And from the angle of the lateral condyle to real stride gives the true length of the forearm. Next is the circumference measurement for the arm and forearm. You have to choose certain fixed bony fixed uh, level from a certain fixed bony point, maybe lateral condyle or conventionally we do, or you can take from middle condyle. So I have taken certain centimeter, you mark the point uh, at a fixed level from fixed bony point, say 10 centimeter. Similarly, I have taken another point, which is 10 centimeter distal to the lateral condyle and taken an arm circumference and forearm circumference. Similarly, I have to take a equal symmetrical point on the opposite side as, on the opposite side as well and compare the, uh, the circumference of the arm and forearm with the opposite side. Next is the deformity measurement. Uh, for that, the deformity may be in the varus, maybe valgus, maybe recurvatum, you have to measure. So for that, what we have to do is, uh, we just draw a point where the anterior axial fold meets the middle aspect of the arm and take another point, uh, another point, which is diametrically opposite to that point. Draw these two points and take a midpoint of this line. Similarly, take, we can take another point, uh, the, middle, the middle most point of the elbow and the lateral most point of the elbow, join these two points and the draw, determine the midpoint and join these two midpoints that will give the axis of the arm. Similarly, you draw the uh, line joining the, the radial astrolite as well as the ulnar astrolite, determine this midpoint, and join this midpoint with the midpoint at the elbow. That's give the, this is the axis of the forearm. Here, the long axis of the, uh, uh, the forearm is directly outward, so the object is the, the valgus is there, this angle is the valgus. You have to draw these lines and measure with a bonometer. Thank you, dear students. At the final, my message is, even if you know all this theory, you should know practical knowledge. You know how to, you may be knowing how to do CPR, but this is not the way how to do CPR. Thank you for attention. Thank you for attention and thanks for here. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. After the initial hiccup, I think it went off very well. Uh, you may feel that it's a little long talk, but it is very important to know exactly how to measure 
and how and what to see in the examination because suddenly some examiner will ask you now demonstrate what is the uh, axis of the limb and you are not able to draw the central line from here uh, from the forearm and the arm we will not go forward at all so it is very important though it may seem tedious but this talk was extremely extremely well uh, extremely informative and all points were covered very well talk thank you dr rajiv uh, very nicely taken so the next talk uh, i'm going to uh, project uh, dr taral nagra's talk it's it's a very very interesting talk on what how to read the radiology of a pediatric elbow i'll just share my screen enigmatic elbow fractures in children uh, the subtitle of this talk is how i'll just pause and ask you if you can hear everything which is going on yes all right to avoid misreading x-rays and misleading diagnosis i am dr taral nagda from srcc and children hospital bombay and let's start the this discussion so this is a 5 year old child with elbow injury and the question is is there a fracture or no fracture and this question can be helped by drawing a line this is anterior humeral line normally it passes through center of capitulum in this case it is passing anterior half of the capitulum which means there is a fracture of lower and humerus with little posterior displacement so this is type 1 supracondylar fracture with a posterior displacement you also see here is a posterior fat pad and this posterior fat pad which has been lifted up again tells you that there is a elbow hematrosis indicative of a fracture in this area so two important points here anterior humeral line and posterior fat pad so it is important to look at uh, these lines this is a child again with a suspected fracture an anterior fat pad and i want to tell you anterior fat pad can be normal in children however if you see a tented anterior fat pad this is known as a sail sign this is abnormal some more lines will help this is a 4 year old child with elbow injury diagnosed as a elbow dislocation opposite side x ray here and uh, what you draw here is radio capital line the radio capital line on injured side is maintained and this tells us that this is not elbow dislocation but a uh, facial separation of lower end of humerus so even without seeing the facies you can diagnose this on basis of drawing these lines radio capital line passes through the center of capitulum in any position of elbow in any view of the x ray and it is disturbed in elbow dislocation displaced lateral condyle fractures and radial head dislocations it is maintained in facial separation and supracondylar fractures so these are two x rays in 6 year old children on the left uh, looks like lateral condyle fracture on the right also looks like lateral condyle fracture what are these injuries so you draw the radio capitular line on the left maintain the humero ulnar line is however displaced so this is not lateral condyle fracture but this is complete facial separation the x ray on the right the radio capitular line is disturbed but humero ulnar line is maintained so here the diagnosis is a lateral condyle fracture so these lines are important a uh, fracture here where both the radio capital line and humero ulnar line are disturbed so diagnosis here is lateral condyle fracture with an elbow dislocation so lines help line is disturbed but ulna is not fracture and ulna fracture the plastic deformation can be diagnosed here by drawing a line along the posterior margin of ulna this is known as mubarak's line and arching of the ulna over the mubarak line can diagnose plastic deformation of elbow and that gives you a diagnosis So your audio has stopped
condyle fracture, the axial view, it is taken with elbow inflection. And you can see that the Hello, sir, your audio is gone, sir. Neeraj, you can try to uh, uh, screen share again. Harshad? I think he is having internet issues, sir. Okay, I'll just get in touch with him. So, sir, you want to do it uh, from your side? So you have to screen share with sound on. It is not audible. So you have to share the screen. I do to, uh, to new share and then do it. Ah, yeah, I got it. Title of this talk is how to avoid oh. misreading X-rays oh, and okay? misleading diagnosis. Yes, it's okay. It's okay. I'm Dr. Taral Nagda from SRCC and children. And that gives you a diagnosis of Montagia lesion. Second tip now, this is again an occult fracture. Uh, uh, and this can be diagnosed very well by taking an internal rotation view of the elbow as described by Dr. Song. So internal rotation view, external rotation view, it helps when you are in confusion. Another view here for medial epicondyle fracture, the axial view, it is taken with elbow inflection. And you can see that the child's left side, a normal AP shows undisplaced medial epicondyle fracture. On the right side on axial view, it shows an anterior displacement. And that's an indication for fixation for these fractures. Two children here again, similar injuries different age groups on the left is 12 year old boy with medial epicondyle fracture on the right is a six year old boy which was diagnosed as a medial epicondyle fracture when you take x-ray of the opposite side you notice that there is no medial epicondyle ossified in this child at six years old uh, child the medial epicondyle doesn't ossify where does this fragment comes from so actually it is a metaphyseal part of the medial condyle um, so in a 12 year old child it becomes a medial epicondyle fracture to be conserved in a six year old child what appears as a medial epicondyle fracture is actually a small part which is ossified of a medial condyle fracture which is a big fracture here and needs to be treated with open reduction and fixation another fracture here diagnosed as a olecranon epophysis avulsion but if you look at age of the child, six year old, at six years, olecron apophysis does not ossify. So this becomes a metaphyseal and hence intraarticular upper end ulnar fracture and needs to be treated with open reduction and fixation. So knowing epiphyseal ossification helps. And in European and Asian, the ossification centers are a bit different. In boys and girls are also, they are different. So roughly the mnemonic is crito, 
so at age of 1 3 5 7 9 and 11 in girls and 2 4 6 8 10 and 12 in boys these centers will ossify so this is the sequence of ossification of the epiphyseal centers there are many ways many mnemonics to remember it but you must remember it so this is a fracture one month after injury and the question is where is the fracture there is stiffness of movements pain and uh, there is something missing here and what is missing here is the medial epicondyle in a in an 11 year old child you should be seeing it you don't see it so it is missing somewhere and here is the missing medial epicondyle so this is an incarcerated medial epicondyle uh, you know which has been diagnosed by checking something which is missing so you should look for missing parts there are some uh, you know instances where x-rays are not enough so this is again a medial side injury and uh, a uh, small fragment this was diagnosed as a medial epicondyle fracture but when you do an mri it shows that there is a big chunk of fracture here and this is actually a medial condyle fracture a big fracture here which is intraarticular and needs to be treated by fixation uh, another modality which can help you to diagnose this an arthrogram which shows there is a big displaced medial condyle chunk much larger than what is seen on the x-ray and this was uh, treated by open reduction and fixation and you can see that how big the fragment is two dis undisplaced lateral condyle fracture and the question was to fix or not to fix and when you are in dilemma again mri can help you on the x-ray on the left the fracture ends in the metaphysis not going into articular surfaces the stable fracture can be treated conservatively in plaster on the right is a fracture which goes all the way to the articular surface so it's a complete fracture and needs to be treated with uh, fixation so mri does help imaging does help in some of the children again this is a medial epicondyle fracture and mri showed there was not much displacement and this uh, fracture could be conserved but ct scan and mri often helps in medial epicondyle fracture because the actual amount of displacement can be accurately assessed here and especially anterior displacement can be assessed on a CT or MR to, 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 the, to know how to treat. So another elbow injury where diagnosis was in confusion looked like a lateral condyle uh, fracture, but uh, this didn't fit into type 1 or type 2 milch where fracture line uh, you know, either goes into the trochlea or uh, at the junction of lateral condyle and the trochlea. It went much more medial when we did uh, the MRI. So it goes all the way from lateral condyle and comes out medially extraarticularly. Not a typical lateral condyle fracture and this could be treated by close reduction and pinning as opposed to open surgery. So three-year-old child uh, again with an elbow injury and which is occult and when we did an MRI this turned out to be an avulsion fracture of the polycranon and this is the injury which could be diagnosed only on MRI and X-rays wouldn't be able to help us in this case with diagnosis. Um, a fracture here, elbow painful, X-ray is normal and MRI shows a radial head fracture which needs to be treated with open reduction and fixation. Another injury is, which is very commonly missed here, a lateral epicondyle osteochondral fracture here missed on an x-ray could be diagnosed on an mri and if this fracture is missed however it can lead to bad arthritis of the radiocapitular joint so these are the few tips here drawing line helps we spoke about anterior humeral line we spoke about radiocapitular line and the mubarak's mm -hmm. line also we spoke about the fat pads proper views will help internal rotation view for lateral condyle fracture an actual view for medial epicondyle fracture. Opposite side X-rays help, especially in medial epicondyle injury. Knowledge of epiphyseal center ossification helps uh, in elbow injuries. Looking for missing parts, especially for medial epicondyle helps. And if you have normal looking X-ray with a child who has a significant injury, imaging helps. So these were some of my tips on uh, 
diagnosing elbow fractures in children. I hope this has been useful to you. Thank you. Uh, enigmatic elbow fractures in children. Fracture or no fracture. Sir? And this question can be helped by drawing a line. This is anterior yeah, yeah. Or a line. <coughs> you can stop the In this case, it How is passing anterior half of the capitulum, which means that the Am I still fracture continue? of lower and humor. I upon... think, uh, Tushtar, you need yeah, to stop yeah. Uh, yeah, the sharing. Still... Uh, ha, ha, just... con... ha. Okay. Uh, Taral is here. If anybody has any questions, you can ask him directly. So X-rays are important uh, for elbow injuries, and uh, you know some of the tips I have shared here. It's important to take a good quality X-ray. You know, a lot of time people take X-ray through the plaster, through the slab, and that doesn't. Help. So you need to take uh, X-ray out of plaster. So if you are treating a lateral condyle fracture, and when the patient comes back to you for follow-up at one week, it's important to take uh, X-ray out of slab or plaster uh, to have more clarity. Thank you, Taral. I think that was a wonderful talk. A lot of yes. uh, practical tips uh, for uh, people going for the exam as well as uh, for consultants who would really want to see pediatric uh, fractures. I'll start the last uh, talk of the day because we are almost out of time. I'll take about 15 minutes and then we'll call it a day. I'm going to talk about uh, fractures uh, which cause a kind of uh, malunion or a non-union uh, resulting in a valgus deformity so i guess my screen can be seen yes sir right so i'm going to talk about uh, uh, fractures which cause a uh, clinical deformity called cubitus valgus it's a very common case in the uh, ms exam and you will have a more or less adolescent patient who will come between the ages of 10 to 14 years with two symptoms. Either he will have a clinically progressive deformity of one of the elbows or he or she will come with deformity of the medial two fingers, either clawing or tingling and numbness. Now, generally, if you go back to the patient's history, the patient will say that he's had an injury many years ago and patient uh, and a patient was all right. There was not much of a problem. Uh, maybe he was treated with a plaster. Maybe he was not treated with a plaster. Patient would have been all right at that point of time. And uh, within a few months, he would have regained his function also. It's only during the ages of 9 to 14 years when the child starts to have a sudden growth spurt or the secondary growth spurt that he will notice that there is an increasing deformity of one of his elbows but functionally, the child will be okay. A, a girl will come to you for a cosmetic deformity and a boy generally will come to you for the ulna no problem uh, with tingling numbness and deformity of the medial two fingers. Examination wise, what you would need to look at is the range of motion of most of these patients. If they have a non-union of the lateral condyle, they will have a good range of motion. It may not be full. There will be some flexion deformity and some terminal restriction of flexion, but overall they will be able to do all routine activities. Three point bony relationship, Dr. Rajiv has alluded to is one of the most important ways where you can get as to what exactly is the problem with the patient. So in the three point bony relationship, you have to palpate the bony prominences by going along the supracondylar ridges. And the first bony prominence is the uh, epicondyle. Here, please don't mistake this point as the lateral epicondyle. Otherwise, you will misdiagnose your case. So it is important that you do a proper palpation from the supracondylar ridges down to the area where the first bony prominence is available, and that is your epicondyle. Similarly, if you want to palpate the point of the ulna, you have to palpate the shaft of the ulna and then go proximally. The most prominent bony point is the tip of the olecrana. 
other than these you may also get thickening and irregularity of the lateral supracondylar ridge remember the medial supracondylar ridge will not be thickened it will not be irregular unlike in a malunited supracondylar fracture where both condyles are broken in the lateral condyle it will only be the lateral side which is thickened and irregular then what you will see is maybe you may get tenderness at the fracture site if the fracture site is early enough and you may have slight increase in internal rotation deformity uh, which is confirmed by the yamamoto test so this is what the x ray would look like you would have a smooth medial side there will be no irregularity on the lateral side there will be some irregularity and you will find the lateral condyle generally as a separate fragment now remember the axis of the elbow joint is oblique it is not horizontal so in the lateral projection you will not see the joint line at all what you will see is overlapping bones uh, unlike in a normal lateral x ray where you see the ulno capitular or the ulno trochlear joint very clearly another important finding which you can mention is that the radial head will be more uh, hypertrophied it will be bigger as compared to what you would see in the opposite side why does that happen because the capitular articulation is lost and the capitulum will restrict the growth of the size of the radial head when the capitulum articulation is lost the radial head will grow uh, more in size now what are the differential diagnosis which other condition can give rise to cubitus valgus of course non union of the lateral condyle is the most common one it is the most commonly diagnosed condition which can give rise to cubitus valgus however there are other conditions also if you have a lateral epiphyseal growth arrest again you will get a increasing valgus deformity or a progressive valgus deformity however in this patient you will not get a thickened supracondylar ridge on the lateral side neither will you feel a bony mass on the lateral side so these two points may differentiate from a non union to a lateral epiphyseal growth arrest lateral condyle fracture with a distal migration and malunion will also give rise to a valgus deformity but what is the difference between a lateral condylar malunion versus a lateral condylar non union remember that the lateral condylar fracture is an intra articular fracture when it is malunited there will be restriction of motion of the elbow joint so a malunited lateral condyle will give restricted motion of the elbow whereas a non union will not give restriction of elbow motion other rare causes of cubitus valgus are malunited medial condyle a medial condyle if it is fractured and uh, migrating distally and getting united or getting malunited you may get a valgus deformity but this deformity is not progressive because the facial growth plate uh, grows equally on both sides and you will not get a progressive valgus avian of the trochlea can also give rise to a valgus deformity now in avian of trochlea the trochlea trochlea is not go, growing at all and there is a deformity but this will be non progressive congenital condition for valgus deformity including turner syndromes and nuhan syndromes you can easily diagnose a congenital deformity with the presence of other deformities plus the deformity will not be preceded by a traumatic event and it will be present probably since birth so you have two types of uh, valgus uh, cubitus valgus you can have a progressive type which is associated with non union of the lateral condyle lateral condylar growth arrest or lateral condylar malunion remember in lateral condylar malunion the range of motion will be restricted or you can have a static type of cubitus valgus which is seen in avian of the trochlea and a condition where there is a malunited medial condyle radiological type tarel has already said it is milch type 1 which is lateral to the trochlea it is little stable and does not give rise to deformity whereas the milch type 2 which is prone for non union will give rise to deformity and will be prone for non union now why does a lateral condyle go more for non union and not mal union is because most of the lateral condyle at the age where the child is fractured is cartilaginous little bit of rotation will now face the cartilaginous portion to the bony portion and the healing therefore is poor also because it's an intraarticular fracture synovial fluid will go inside the fracture and prevent spontaneous union ulnar nerve palsy will present generally as a slow ulnar nerve palsy it will not be an acute palsy 
therefore it is called tardy ulnar nerve palsy and a lot of people come with a deformity of the medial two fingers which would be a typical claw hand tardy ulnar nerve palsy in this type of uh, of an injury of cubitus valgus is generally the high ulnar nerve type palsy now you know what is the difference between a high ulnar nerve palsy and a low ulnar nerve palsy a low ulnar nerve palsy the deformity is more whereas in a high ulnar nerve palsy the deformity is less the reason being that in a high ulnar nerve palsy the lung flexors are also affected therefore the contracture or the flexion deformity of the fingers is less so the clawing is less now treatment of tardy ulnar nerve palsy is anterior transposition of the ulnar nerve there is no conservative treatment for this there is no observation for this if the patient has an ulnar nerve palsy you really don't also require to ask for an emg nerve conduction the deformity is very clear and you should do a procedure or you should directly answer in the exam that i would like to do an anterior transposition of the ulna now remember surgically when they ask you the step you have to see to it that you mention that you release the ulna now proximally to the point where it comes from the anterior compartment to the posterior compartment through the medial intermuscular septum so you have to release it up to the arcade of struthers if this word comes the arcade of struthers everybody will be happy then you can place it either in a submuscular plane or in the subcutaneous plane depending on what your choice is or what the examiner wants to hear now what is the treatment for cubitus valgus deformity as i said patient is functionally okay the condyle is in is in non union and it is in non union for a number of years so the aim of your correction is to correct the valgus deformity and not address the non union the reasons i'll give in the next slide but remember when you're correcting this deformity in a valgus deformity normally you would straight away do a medial uh, a lateral open wedge osteotomy or a medial close wedge osteotomy however doing these osteotomies open or close you are bound to change the axis the proximal and the distal uh, arm axis change so you will get a lateral translation uh, or a medial translation depending on which osteotomy you have done so what you need to do is to do a transverse osteotomy and do a medialization or lateralization a lateralization of the uh, of the distal fragment so as to get the axis aligned once the axis is aligned then your forearm and the arm axis become collinear and your function becomes better so case example with the video these patients generally have full range of motion without much of a problem you can see the deformity is corrected and the range of motion is also restored why not ask for osteosynthesis why not get the non union to unite to each other there are two problems associated with this number one in a fracture which is a, more than a few years old the condyle fragment deforms it loses its normal shape it loses its normal anatomy so repositioning it back and getting it to get back to the normal configuration is very very difficult also if you try and dissect out the fragment to reposition it you will more likely uh, convert it into a avascular fragment and therefore established non union you should not try to get the fracture to heal you will also lose range of motion and you will also have av and other fragment i think that's what i want to say and we have finished off the presentation i hope uh, everybody has understood this and anybody has any questions uh, you can answer right now you can ask right now sorry tushar shad is taral there okay he doesn't seem to be there uh, so uh, one point where uh, he mentioned many of the osteochondral lesions or the sort of invisible lesions on x ray which were diagnosed on mri uh, they are called the trash lesions t dot r dot a dot s dot h the so radiologically apparently seemingly harmless so i think the delegates or the student should know that there is something called as trash lesions in the pediatric elbow and one question i want to ask you arshad is do you ever have to use bone grafting in uh, treatment if of if you are doing a non union then yes you require to have a bone graft 
non unions you should try and fix only if you have a lateral condyle which is coming within a year of injury mm-hmm. now these patients will not come with a cubitus valgus deformity they will come in your opd with an injury which has happened recently here if you are talking about a cubitus valgus in an exam generally the uh, the fracture is years old now if you want to attempt a union you should if the examiner really wants you to try and say that i will try and heal the fracture you should give him the problem saying that the fragment is deformed i'll have to dissect out posteriorly where the vascularity is i might convert it into a avascular fragment so i would prefer not to do a fixation if the examiner still insists then you can say yes i'll keep the posterior pedicle intact i will dissect out i will realign and put in a bone graft now this bone graft can be through the fragment into the uh, humeral condy into the distal end of the humerus so as act as a strut and then uh, get that fragment to heal or you can put in bone graft at the fracture site after freshening it but this exa- this answer should come forced you should not give it out voluntarily you should not uh, say that i will try and fix that non union of 8 uh, years 9 years it, it is just not practically feasible so point well brought out for the students um, i think that should just about we are at 10:15 so i think yeah. the students we will encourage if you want you can still continue posting questions to us uh, to arshad to me and um, means our numbers will be sent out and then we can address it in the coming elbow session next week yeah so next week just tushar tell them what we are planning for the next week so we are uh, planning to keep um, missed montagia fracture we are planning to keep unreduced posterior elbow dislocation and stiff elbow and then uh, we'll try to keep some tidbits that will uh, will encourage discussion so that within an hour we can finish that and uh, see students if you really feel that this is useful then please give us that feedback because it does take effort from everybody's part to conduct these talks and if you want us to improve also give us feedback uh, right arshad yes uh, thank you very much uh... Uh, tushar and thank you very much rajiv and thank you taral for being here and i also wish to thank neeraj and his team uh, from ortho tv for uh, giving us this platform and uh, uh, good night and thanks to all the delegates it's really late and uh, hopefully next time we'll uh, we can uh, conduct this the plan is to conduct it next saturday uh, same time and uh, hopefully we will uh, conduct uh, Uh, it on a regular basis every week now it all depends on what kind of feedback you students give and what kind of uh, response we get so thank you everybody and good night and we can leave all right bye bye good night